Chance is Life's Only Certainty, Part 1, Vietnam, February 1969. We had been ambushed twice already that week, and we were about to descend into the valley once more. I walked point the, night, the day before, and I was going to walk point again that afternoon. But now I was taking up the rear. I looked out at the point man at the other side, up front. I waved, the new guy was up there. He waved back at me. We went down into the valley. We were there maybe more than a click or so, maybe 45 minutes, when rockets came in. And they came down, and I heard them going over, and they were going down to the front. And the job of the person who's in the rear, the guys that are in the rear, is to take the high ground. So, I, so me and a few other guys, we climbed back up the mountain. And we got about maybe 50 yards, and we found the trees and some boulders, and we got down. And that's where we stayed because the snipers had us picked off. We couldn't pick up our heads. And we laid there. And we waited. And we stayed there for five days. And on the night of the fifth day, I laid there and I prayed. I prayed for my mother, who had lost her, her brother, her youngest brother of Normandy, the beach of Normandy on D-Day. I thought of my grandmother, how she used to cry years later. And I wondered, what is she sobbing about? And my mother would tell me. She's thinking about Uncle Irving. And this was many, many years later. I didn't want my mother to be thinking that. I prayed for my father. I prayed for my brother, all to forget me. I prayed for my wife, who I had married just two weeks before I went to Vietnam. I prayed, I prayed for that moment that she was actually in the arms of somebody else, that she, I had no reason to believe she was. She wrote me letters every day. I got dozens and dozens, hundreds of letters. But I prayed that she was. I prayed that she was thinking and worrying about how she's going to tell me, because I wanted her to forget me too. I never prayed for myself. I prayed because there's no reason to pray for myself, because I'd be dead in the morning. I remember that new guy. I laid there and I thought of the new guy and I told him, I remember telling him. He asked me, he said, early on, he said, what's the first thing, what should I do? What's, what's the most important thing to know? And I had told that new guy, the one that was walking point. I had told him the first thing you do is when the shit hits the fan is you hit the ground. And then you figure out what else you're going to do. I thought about all this. And, if, and that night, and it's every night before, there was something called Puff the Magic Dragon, I believe was the name. It was a synchronized machine gun that was mounted on, a, on an airplane. And that was over us every night, firing all around. And it was doing it that night, too. I was down to my last few swallows of water. We had run out of food. And I laid there. And I thought of all this. And I knew when morning come, I wouldn't be alive. But morning came. It came with a thunderous rattle, a thunderous crack of grenades. Three companies, three companies of, of, uh, of American soldiers were coming to get us, to get us out of this ambush. And they wiped out the, the North Vietnamese that we were fighting. Now, we carried the dead up that, night, that day, and one of them was that new guy. I guess he couldn't get down fast enough because the bullet was right here. Part 2, September 11, 2001. I was standing on the corner of 30, 31st and 5th when I saw the first tower get hit. The flames, the flames were coming out. And I didn't know, no one knew what was going on. We were all probably around at that time, of course. And no one knew what was going on. And I asked, I asked people on the street, what, what did anybody know? And they didn't know. So I called my daughter, and she, and she was home. And I asked her, you have the TV on. What's going on? And the towel was burning. And she put on the TV, and she said, I don't know, it sounds like they said a plane did it. And as she's talking to me, another plane, another explosion comes. It's a South Tower. And it's up. And I'm saying, oh my God, what's going on? And then she tells me they're talking about terrorists. 
And I said, and she said to me, well, you should always say, she said, get the fuck out of the city. And I said, I said, this is New York. Now I'm a regular New Yorker. I said, this is New York. And I went, and I went down the block, and I went to a cafe. And I sat down. I had breakfast. I didn't know what was going on. The TV was on. People were underneath the TV ordering their breakfast. You know, they, no one had the shock yet of what was going on. And I sat there. And then I saw the tower was burning, and then that plane that went into uh, the plane that went into the Pentagon. And at that moment, everyone was looking. And then they got back to the towers. And then I saw the towers crumble. And I knew we were at war. And I got into war mode again. I said, I tried to look at my cell phone. And I saw I couldn't make any phone calls. There was no signal. I remembered that there was a, a uh, phone booth on the corner. So I ran out to the corner. I was the first one there. I was trying to reach my wife in New Jersey, but I couldn't remember how to make a long distance call because I'm so used to using my cell phone. And I'm trying to figure out, I can't figure out what to do. So I called my brother in Brooklyn. I said, do me a favor, call my wife, call Janet. She's, she's over at Jen, my daughter Jen's place. And he did. And now I said, what do I do? I look around, it's quiet in the city. I go and I start walking back. And now I go, back to 31st and 5th. And I look again, and now, as you know, it was serious. Just dust and smoke coming from there. And I called the ground zero before I heard anyone else call the ground zero, because I had been in ground zeros before. And I looked there, and I thought, you see, I had a choice to make that morning. I was coming into the city from New Jersey, and I had planned to meet someone for lunch near the trade center. And I had planned to go, as I always did, take the train to Newark, take the PATH train into the trade center and go up to the North Tower, go up to the to the Borders bookstore and have my bagel and cream cheese there. But at the last second, I said, you know, I'm not. I'm not gonna go downtown first. It was early in the morning. I said, I'm gonna go uptown and meet a few customers up there and then go back downtown. So at that last second, I bought the ticket to Penn Station, New York. And now here I was looking up at the buildings. I started to walk back to Penn Station. Someone said the trains were still going. I walked down 32nd Street, 31st, 32nd Street, where there's a Franciscan church. And on one side, and on this side, is a fire station. I saw, I saw the people. I saw the firemen standing there as I was standing by the church, and I looked at them, and their heads were down. I don't know if they were there and back already or whatever, but they had, their heads were down, and I looked at them, and I knew that now they were the infantry men, that they were the grunts. I knew what they'd be thinking years from now. And I walked, and I went to Penn Station. I went down to Penn Station. I went into the train. The train was leaving. It was going to leave. I go into the train. I get inside, and now the door's closed, and I'm we'll be heading back to Princeton, but the train doesn't start. And I'm saying to myself, what am I doing? I could be underground. I said, this, I could be here forever. Who knows what they're hitting, what they're doing. This is a war. The train doors open. I come out, and we're to Penn Station. So now, I said, where can I go? I have friends in the city, but they're all in high buildings. It's, it's, it's silent. It's quiet out there now, you know. You remember. There was nothing fighter jets. I had heard fighter jets before, so I know. And my friend Doris, right across the street from Penn Station, she worked for a big company in her office on the third floor. I decided to go up to her office. I walked in, it was chaos there. I just walked in right through the reception. My friend Doris sees me, she says, you could pick a hell of a day to come into the city. I said, you have a phone. I got onto her phone, got a line through, got to my wife, told her I was okay. Now I stayed there. I stayed there for several hours. People were in the conference room looking at the news and, and, and buildings over and over again coming down. And I knew that that's a bad thing to do. You don't want to do that now. You don't want to watch that. I went into another room where people were still having some meetings going. And I looked out at Penn Station and I waited. And eventually, and a man, a man was there in the office. His son was down at 
the trade center. He was worried. He couldn't reach him. He was waiting. He was hoping. Well, after a few hours, his son came. His son said they hugged. But there they were. And now it was about 2.30, 3 o'clock. Penn Station is crowded on the outside of 7th Avenue all around. And I hear that they're opening up Penn Station. So I go down there in the crowd. I saw somebody I knew. I was talking to them. But while I was talking to them, there was still a war mode. I, I was looking at the buildings because there could be snipers. And they weren't. And then I went into Penn Station. Very orderly, very nice. And now I'm in Penn Station. What do I see? I see people who have walked all the way from the Trade Center. They're covered in white soot and plaster and whatever. And they're covered in, they're in suits. And I look at them and I see the looks on their faces. I know that. Right. But I was in an out-of-body experience, you see. I was numb to all this. And now, we get in, we're on, we get into the train, we're going back to Princeton. And I see some young men in front of me, also covered with this degree. And I hear them talking. They're young men, they're about 30, 30 years old. And they're talking, someone talking about their husband, uh, about their wives. And, they, and I can see they were shopping. And one of them was talking about the building that he was in. And it might have been number five, number seven. I don't know which building it was at, at, at this moment. But that building, they were told to evacuate because it wasn't safe. Now we travel and we're getting to Penn Station. I look, I look back, because remember on my trip in, I had looked, as always, at the New York skyline. But now we came around lower Manhattan and it was just a smoke rising. Now we're getting close, we're getting close to my stop in Princeton Junction. I look, I get up, I look down at the young men, and I see the one man, and I said to him, hug your wife when you get home. And now I look, and I saw the people on the platform all waiting for their loved ones. They're there, women, children, men, waiting for their wives, loved ones. And I remember, I remember when I came home from now, my brother, my mother, my father, my wife. I'll never forget the kiss she gave me that, to this day. Three weeks, we'll be married 45 years. I got off and I saw these people and I felt for them. And now I went home. My, my wife was still not home. She was with my daughter. I get into my house, I put on the TV, I listen to some messages on the voicemail. One of them's from my cousin. I say, I remember then that he, that flight from, San, uh, from Boston, that went to Boston, Newark, San Francisco, he took that flight all the time. He, he worked in Boston for a consulting company and went home. And I said, Oh my God, he wasn't on that flight because he was calling me from California to see how I was doing. On the TV, I heard that, that building that young man was in had, had fallen. Now at home, I have two things that remind me of that day, which remind me of these two events. I have a combat infantry badge that's worn any person who's been in the infantry but has been in combat gets that. And that is worn up here, above all other medals. If you see any generals, you see anyone who's been in the military, that's been in the infantry, it doesn't matter what he has, he will wear that infantry badge above everything else. And the other thing I have is the ticket from the Princeton Junction that they didn't collect that day, dated. September 11, 2001. Chance is life's only certainty. Wow. <laughs>